On uh, Wednesday, I'll be leaving for uh, Sandy Hook, Maryland, and uh, we'll be involved with a CBMC family conference there from Wednesday through Sunday. So if you can squeeze in a little extra prayer or two uh, during that time, it'll all be appreciated that uh, the Lord would would use our ministry there. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In uh, chapter 5, as you'll remember, Paul was writing about our position as ambassadors. That is to say, uh, he speaks of us as though we had already become citizens of the of theme. Our citizenship is in heaven. And as though God had sent us as ambassadors to this foreign country, and we're to represent him uh, in our own native country, which is heaven. We were born from above. Uh, we were received a heavenly birth and thereby gained citizenship in heaven. And we're now ambassadors here with uh, something to do. And so he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you remember, he spoke of some who had believed in vain. And we covered that subject at that time. There is a belief that's short of salvation. That is to say, there's a mental acceptance of the fact that uh, there is a need for a Savior and uh, a mental acceptance of the fact that God provided a Savior and uh, there is such a thing as believing that Jesus Christ was that Savior uh, that he sent into this world, which was in need of a Savior, and still never applying that to the individual life. Uh, that is to say, never uh, receiving him as one's own personal savior. Uh, the analogy would be uh, to the uh, Passover lamb. It would have been possible for uh, those folks on that occasion to have put up the lamb on the 10th day of the month, uh, as they were commanded to do, and to have slain the lamb on the 14th day. And... Uh, uh, to have actually uh, filled the uh, basin with the blood. But unless the blood was struck upon the doorpost, unless the blood of the lamb was applied to the door of the house, there was no salvation. And unless the blood of God's slain, slain lamb is applied to our own hearts, to the doors of our own hearts, there is no salvation. And uh, I fear that in our modern types of evangelism, there's much uh, which would uh, constitute believing in vain or uh, having heard of the grace of God in vain. There is a, another aspect to this, uh, this receiving the grace of God in vain, and probably that's the aspect that's, uh, that's meant here, for we're told that it's grace upon grace. That is to say, we're saved by grace, and then it's by God's grace that he lets us be involved as his ambassadors, doing his work in this world. And so uh, he might be bestowing this grace in vain because we won't appropriate it. And it probably is the second wave of grace uh, in, uh, in uh, the uh, Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1. You'll remember that... Uh, uh, the writer says that that the, the law came by Moses in uh, in the John 1:16, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Now that uh, could be translated wave after wave of grace, two way uh, a wave of grace, then another wave of grace, a wave of grace whereby which we were saved, and a wave of grace whereby we, whereby we serve. For he says in verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but the grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And I, what I'm saying is, it's probably that second uh, grace 
also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Verse 2, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now know that this is usually quoted uh, when it has reference to encouraging somebody to be saved. That now is the day to get saved. But uh, there's another aspect of that also. It's that aspect that um, uh, the day is far spent and we need to work while it is day. For the night cometh when no man shall work, Jesus says. The, uh, uh, he said this in John chapter 9. He said, work while it's day for the night cometh. That is for the world. So as ambassadors for Christ, today is the day of salvation. Uh, to whatever extent we're not involved in God's plan of salvation, uh, as saved people, to whatever extent we're not involved, now we'll never be involved because today is the day of salvation. He's quoting here from the 49th chapter of Isaiah. You're going to find in the 6th chapter of 2 Corinthians, there's two important quotes from uh, the Old Testament. And this one is the one, uh, this is one of those quotes here uh, from uh, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. And he wants to make, make an analogy of Jesus Christ, and he's going to use this word, grace of God in vain. He's going to, he's going to show the difference between what it means to uh, be doing something in vain, really, and what appears to be in vain, as far as God's program is concerned. And he's going to uh, give us the how a uh, servant of God involves himself, but he wants to use Christ as the example. And he does that, that by quoting a prophetic portion from Isaiah which speaks of Christ. And so we're going to spend a little time there in that 49th chapter, so we might uh, hold our place or not as you choose, but turn now to Isaiah chapter 49. At first reading, this would seem to be uh, concerning the nation of Israel because if you look at verse 3, of Isaiah 49, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Now, we would think that since it says Israel, it means Israel. But you see, all through this portion, God has alternately spoken of Israel as his servant and of Christ as his servant. And uh, he, this is done with, with the word servant, and it's also done with the word son. We'll show you this in a moment, and then we'll, uh, so that you can understand it. Look in chapter, in Isaiah 41 for a moment. In 41, 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Now, this is speaking of the servant, Israel. But now look at chapter 42. Verse 1, Behold my servant, whom I have up, uh, uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the heathen. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment in truth. He shall not fail, and so forth. Now, this is all speaking of Christ from verse 1 through verse 3. We needn't wonder about that because in Matthew chapter 12, in verses 18 through 21, Jesus Christ quotes these three verses and says that it's speaking of him. He's the servant. Uh, and this phrase, when we, when we get it over in Matthew chapter 12, where it says, uh, in, my, uh, in whom my soul delighteth, it says, in whom I am well pleased. But this is... Uh, this is speaking of Christ, and the New Testament documents that for us. But then look again in chapter 43, verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. Now here again, he's speaking of Israel. The context will tell us that. In chapter 44, verse 1, yet he, now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Again, Israel is the servant in uh, 44.21. Remember these, O Jacob, and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee, thou art 
my servant, O Israel. Again, it's Israel who is the servant. But look at chapter 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many was aston astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. And as you go on here, you can readily tell that this is Christ. It's documented throughout the New Testament as being descriptive of Christ. So alternately, beginning with the uh, 40th, first chapter and extending on through the 52nd chapter or the 53rd chapter, Christ and Israel are alternately called the servant of Jehovah, the servant of the Lord. Now, as I said, you have a similar situation and in reference to God's son in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, uh, God, Jehovah calls Israel, the nation of Israel, his son. And in Hosea, the gospel of Hosea, I mean the prophet Hosea, verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, he says, I have called my son out of Egypt. Well, now that's, uh, uh, that's Israel, isn't it? He called Israel out of Egypt. But when that verse is quoted in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, it says, that the scripture may be fulfilled that I, I have called my son out of Egypt. It's speaking of Christ. When, his, when Joseph and Mary took Christ down into Egypt to uh, escape the massacre on the part of Herod. And so the Matthew 22 quotes Hosea 11.1 1, and calls the Son of God out of Egypt, Christ. And so these two are used interchangeably. How can that be so? It can be so because... Christ came to do, in part, that which Israel did not do. That is, to take God's message to a lost and dying world. And so, you will find them used interchangeably. And in this Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3, it says Israel, but it means Christ. And you can see this in the context. Once you know it, it shouldn't be any trouble to see it at all. But you should see what some of the uh, commentaries that are written by the liberal school of theology do with this uh, portion here. It's a sight to behold. So let's start in chapter 49. Listen, O isles, that means all the inhabited places unto me, and hearken ye peoples from far, the Lord hath called me, that is Jesus Christ, from the womb, from the belly or body of my mother, hath he made mention of my name. Now this is refers to the fact that before he was ever born, uh, angelic uh, messengers came to both Mary and to Joseph and said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. So his name was mentioned before he was born. Now verse 2, He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. And this is the same one that in Revelation it says, And out of his mouth came a two-edged sword. It's speaking that he has made my mouth a sharp sword means that uh, he came, Christ came to speak. For God uh, put forth his word. In the shadow of his hand hath he hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hidden me and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. You see, this is quoting Jehovah uh, saying, Thou art my servant, and it's Christ who's the servant here, in whom I will be glorified. And we're told in the New Testament, fact is in John chapter 17, Christ said uh, that he, that's why he came, to glorify God. He says, I have glorified you in this world. Verse 4, then I said, this is the servant speaking, I have labored in vain. Here's our word vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yea, yet surely judgment uh, is due me, uh, the judgment due me, I'm trying to read two different translations here. My judgment due me is with the Lord and my work with my God. Now, here's the whole thought of this. The picture is that of a hunter. And uh, the thought is that in his quiver, the hunter who is hunting with bow and arrow will have some uh, arrows uh, with which he hasn't spent much time. He just found a, a sharp stone somewhere and he uh, tied it onto a shaft and uh, he put it in his quiver. But in his spare time, just in... Uh, 
in case he runs across a prized piece of game, like a, a buck deer, for instance, he's got one that he's put on the very straightest shaft that he can find. And he's, uh, he's found a, a, a flint, and he's honed it with utmost caution so it will go true to the mark. Now, the, the picture is this. The hunter goes out uh, down the, the trail, and he sees a rabbit. Well, he sees several rabbits during each time he goes hunting, and he can get a rabbit any time. Well, he'll just pick any old arrow out there, uh, out of that quiver, and shoot it to the rabbit, because uh, if he misses it, there'll be another rabbit. But if he were to see a deer, uh, he would make sure that he would uh, pick his highly honed arrow, that it would hit the mark, because he'd see a deer only once a month or so, and it would be a very valuable prize. So therefore, he'd be very careful. So what the second verse means is, I am that very carefully honed arrow, and he's hidden it, it's, uh, so to speak, uh, the picture is, let's suppose you got uh, these arrows in the quiver, and uh, here's one arrow, and he sees all the other arrows being used, and he says, look, the, the hunter must have something against me, he's always using another arrow besides me, and I stay here, uh, he spent all this time honing me and getting me just right, and I stay back here in this quiver all the time, hidden. But you see, one day, that honed, highly honed quiver or arrow was taken out of the quiver and put to the bow. And then the lament is, in verse 4, that it was all for naught. Uh, it was in vain. And from the human standpoint, the ministry of Christ on this earth was in vain because he said that he came to save Israel. He came to to bring Israel back to God as a nation. And he didn't accomplish that, did he, when he came here? And it looks as though his ministry was a defeat after God had used all of that uh, care in uh, preparing him. Uh, this would be the 30 years of his life before he was uh, ever sent forth. Uh, he was 30 years old before he began to minister for the Father. And he ministered three and a half years and then apparently his ministry was in vain. It was no effect because he did not bring Israel back to repentance as a nation. But notice how he ends this fourth verse. Uh, for he says that uh, uh, my judgment or the justice due me is with the Lord and my work with God. He's saying so much, well, I know that I did just what the Father asked me to do. Uh, he said, I do always those things which please the Father. He did the work of the Father, so he'll just leave the results with the Father. Now, let's see uh, what the answer is. Now, the Lord Jehovah is going to answer the complaint that uh, uh, that he, was, uh, he had spent his strength uh, in vain. And now saith the Lord who formed me from the womb in his, uh, to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Now you see, it's obvious that the servant here is not Israel, because the servant's purpose is to bring Israel back to God. Let's read this again, and you can be sure that the servant is not Israel. See, and now saith the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant. It has to be the same servant that we had in the second chapter, uh, I mean the first verse, because uh, the, the language is the same. He formed me in the womb for what purpose? To bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet will I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall uh, be my strength. So he was sent to gather Israel, but Israel's not gathered. But this fifth verse should make it clear to us that Israel is not the servant that's being discussed here. Now look at verse 6. And he said, this is the answer of Jehovah to the complaint that it looks like his labor was in vain. It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore uh, the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light unto the heathen or the Gentiles or the nations of the world, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. See, the answer of Jehovah is, look, it wasn't a failure for you to go down to the earth and preach to Israel, and then die without Israel coming back to me. 
because I had something bigger in mind for you than to bring Israel back to their God. And that was that you might be for the salvation of the ends of the earth. Now, that's where we come in, isn't it? You see, uh, the servant accomplished something greater in what would appear to be a labor in vain. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, now this Holy One, his Holy One, uh, Jehovah's Holy One is the servant, to him whom man despises, to him whom the, nations, the nation, the nation of Israel abhors, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship because the Lord who is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. This is speaking of Christ, the chosen one. Verse 8. Now, here's the verse that's quoted in our second Corinthians script. Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, that's Israel, to establish the earth, and to cause, the inherent, to, uh, cause to inherit the desolate heritage, that thou mayest go, that thou mayest say to the prisoner, Go for it. To them who are in darkness, show yourself. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all the high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall there be heat uh, of the sun to smite them. For he who hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water, and so forth. So what we have here is in the latter part of the sixth verse again, that thou mayest be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now here's why Paul is quoting this. He says, look, it appeared as though the ministry of Christ was in vain. And this is pointed out in verse 4 of this uh, chapter 49. But it was a misconception, only a misconception of what he really came to earth for that would bring about that conclusion. He really came to bring salvation to all the earth. And now in 2 Corinthians, Paul saying, and this is that day of salvation spoken of in Isaiah 49. And he says that's why it's so important to be an ambassador for Christ. Now let's go back and read in the fifth chapter again and, and tie this in. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ Reconciling, reconciling the world to himself, not just Israel. Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech by us, we uh, beseech in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him uh, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, so he's saying that when Christ hung on the cross, when he became sin for us, God was bringing salvation to all the world, and it's going to be accomplished through his ambassadors. So he's saying what appears to be in vain is not always in vain. And he's saying uh, uh, that salvation that Christ brought to all the world uh, this is the day of that salvation. Now, Isaiah had prophesied about 800 years before Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. Isaiah had prophesied that Messiah would bring salvation. The servant of God would bring salvation, not just to the nation of Israel, but to all the world. So, uh, uh, this is his application of, uh, of the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we'll... Read that again then, uh, 1 through uh, 1 and 2. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain, for he saith, and here's the quote from Isaiah 49, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things and uh, approving or commending ourselves as the ministers of God. Now he says, here's what's going to happen, or here's the circumstances under which God is going to minister. These are the circumstances under which that servant 
ministered, that whose work apparently was in vain, uh, although he was so carefully prepared by God. Now, we're going to have some 28 uh, characteristics of a servant of God, and this would be primarily to Christ and then to those who come to take his place to serve. The first 10 of these begin in your English language Bible with the preposition in, and it speaks of the things that surround, or uh, it speaks of those things to which the servant of God is subjected, uh, but in all things approving or co uh, commending ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in affliction, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, and in fastings. Now that's ten, preceded by the preposition in. Uh, the uh, in much patience. This is not speaking of that inward uh, grace of patience. It's speaking of the fact that you'll be subjected to many things that you must endure. In other words, uh, it's speaking, it's, your thought should be to the outside force rather than the inner uh, motivation or the inner manifestation. Uh, it, those things, you know, the Bible says, tribulation bringeth, worketh patience. Well, what it means is the servant of God is going to have to be subjected to much which he'll have to endure. And uh, then he uh, goes on to say, in afflictions, in the first chapter, this uh, word is translated tribulation. In other words, he's going to be in tribulations or afflictions. He's going to be in necessities. That means hardships. In distresses, that means things will press upon you. In stripes, that would be beatings. In imprisonments, in tumults. As you read the book of Acts, have you noticed how many times the Apostle Paul was right in the middle of a great tumult? Uh, remember uh, the time when he was stoned there in uh, Asia Minor and they left him, dragged him out and left him for dead and then uh, uh, great tumults raised up, uh, raised up against him in uh, Philippi when he was jailed and then again in Thessalonica and again in Berea and then uh, uh, the great tumult that he was in the middle of in uh, in Ephesus in chapter 19 of Acts and right on through the tumult in Jerusalem when he was brought to, to task there. So he he says uh, in tumults. That's, that was a characteristic of uh, the, um, the servant of God. And of course, the same thing was uh, characteristic of Christ. We could say all these things concerning Christ. In labors, that means he had to work hard. In, in watchings, that means uh, he didn't get to sleep a lot of nights. And in fastings, uh, whether self-imposed or whether he didn't, just didn't have enough to eat. And so he says, all of those things, if a, as a, if a minister of God is subjected to all of those things, apparently uh, God is showing his disfavor. Uh, apparently, uh, this workman is really uh, failing. But he's saying... Uh, that's not the way you tell. Uh, what appears to be in vain would not necessarily be in vain. Now we have uh, the uh, inward uh, actions in verse 6. By pureness, or purity, that is, by knowledge, by long suffering, and by kindness. These are the inner vir uh, virtues. Remember in chapter 5, Paul says, The love of, of Christ constrains me. He says, uh, I'm motivated because there's something within me. Well, the, uh, he says the servant of God needs to show pureness. He needs to have knowledge, long-suffering, and kindness. And then he's speaking of the, the things that God furnishes uh, by the Holy Spirit, by love unfeigned. That means by uh, true love or uh, sincere love. Uh, by the word of truth, by the power of God by the armor, or the weapons that is, armory really this is, uh, by the weapons of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, that means that God arms us with both hands. And then, uh, as by some contrast here, by honor and dishonor, that is to say, when you're ministering for God, you'll be honored by some and you'll be dishonored by some. That's just a characteristic. And then uh, 
uh, by evil report and by good report. Some will speak evil of you, and some will speak good of you. Uh, so you don't, you can't measure God's true servant or his effectiveness or whether or not his message is in vain by whether or not the report is evil or good, because it says to be both kind. Uh, this was true with Christ, was it not? He was honored by some and he was dishonored. He was spit upon by some and he was honored by some. And uh, he uh, he was uh, give uh, some uh, people. Some of them reported that his works were of the devil. So he had evil reports and good reports. And he says, uh, and then then notice our preposition changes to this in the eighth verse to as, and he's going to make some uh, comparisons here. He'll say, as deceivers, you'll be treated as deceivers, although you're true. He says, even though you're speaking truth, you'll be treated like a deceiver. And people say he's deceiving. Well, they said that of Christ. They also said it of, of the Apostle Paul. He's a deceiver. Verse 9, as unknown and yet well known. There's a sense in which Christ was an unknown, and yet he was known of many and well known. And the same thing with Apostle Paul, and the same by an involved servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9 again, as dying, and behold, we live. Now he says this is a strange thing. In dying, that would be the ultimate in defeat, wouldn't it? To, to die would mean that you couldn't carry on your your operation. But he says, just as Christ died and is alive, he says, I count myself to have died, died yet I live. This is what he said, for instance, in Galatians 2.20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And he said this same thing back in the fifth chapter of Second Corinthians uh, in verse 15, and that he died for all, that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. He says, I treat myself as though I had already died, because God looks upon it that way. And, uh, back in the ninth verse of the second chapter, and behold, we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Now, that's an enigma, isn't it? Uh, uh, Christ was called the man of sorrows. But in Hebrews 12, we're told for the joy that was set before him, he endured the suffering and the shame, even to death on the cross. So he was the man of sorrows, and yet he rejoiced. This is true of, uh, of the involved servant of God. Verse 10 again, as, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich. Now, here's a strange thing. He says, Christ was poor, but he made many rich. How can a poor man make many rich? He says, the true servant of God is in that position. Destitute of worldly goods, but making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. So you see, uh, the marks of a true servant are uh, are many enigmas, uh, apparent uh, contradictions. And yet he says, these all characterize. What he's doing, you see, he had been discredited by the leadership there in, in Corinth, although he had founded the church and worked there among them for a, a year and a half. As he writes this letter, he'd been discredited. And so what he's doing, he's recounting what a real servant of God is like. And he refers to the uh, uh, scripture in Isaiah because no doubt he had used that in teaching them to show that, uh, that this was Christ. And so what they're supposed to be able to do now is to compare Christ with the ministry of Paul among them. And they're supposed to be able to discern that his ministry among them was like the ministry of Christ. And therefore, the true discerning believer would recognize that a servant of God, a true servant of God, was among them. You see, 
uh, they had cast a, uh, aspersions on him by saying, look, uh, he didn't accomplish anything, did he? You know, that type of thing. Now he's going to pour out his heart to them. This uh, portion here, verses 11 through 13, are somewhat difficult to understand in the King James Version. In some of the other versions, like, for instance, the New Schofield has, has rewritten it in the footnotes. And uh, I'm going to read it uh, as you have it in the King, King James, and we'll explain it from there. So in uh, chapter 6, verse 11, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now, for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Now, this is what Paul is saying. He says, I'm completely open with you. I don't have any reservations whatsoever. Now, there is an estrangement between you and I. You are straightened. That means you're confined. You're not open as I am. And uh, he says, that's not my fault. And it's not because I have that attitude against you. It's because you have that attitude against me. Uh, so you feel straightened in your relationship to me. You feel constrained in your relationship to me. Well, I just want you to know, I don't have the same thoughts uh, towards you, and you don't have those thoughts towards me because of me. It's because in your own selves, uh, you've, uh, you've brought about something which, um, uh, which has caused you to have that attitude. And so he says, uh, I want to beseech you, open wide your hearts to us. And this us is an editorial us. He's speaking of himself. So he says, uh, I don't want you to be like that. I want you to open up. You've closed in. And it's your fault, not mine. And I'm not closed up against you. I'm wide open. So let's deal on that basis. And he says, now if I've got your attention, I want to tell you something. Verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Now this is, uh, this is the other quotation that I was speaking of. Actually, it's two others. It comes from uh, the... Uh, 37th chapter of Ezekiel and from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. There are similar passages in the two different Old Testament prophetic books. Now, this is one of the key passages in the Bible that have to do with the doctrine of Christian separation. And it's used quite frequently uh, in the marriage relationship. And it's all right to use it there because... Uh, how can you do God's work in the world as one because God considers if you're married, you're one? And uh, how can half of one work for God and half of one not work for God? Uh, so uh, the, the marriage relationship is the closest form in this life of being yoked. So it's all right to use it. But he's really speaking of any situation in which two people would uh, essay a uh, to do God's work in this world. To be yoked is to do work. Uh, you, uh, and, and this will always fit when you see this uh, figure of speech. You see, uh, an ox never wears a yoke unless you want him to work. If you don't, you, when you put the yoke on him, that means he's got some work to do. If you take the yoke off, he's not going to work anymore. Now, an ox also never has an, uh, a yoke on him unless he's going to work with another ox. 
Uh, you don't yoke a single ox. In fact, two oxen are even called a yoke of oxen, are they not? Because the yoke is that instrument by which the two ox, oxen are tied together for the purpose of working. And when you see yoke together, that means to do work. And that's what Jesus uh, said uh, when, when he was speaking of restful service in, uh, in Matthew chapter 11, uh, if you will... Uh, if you remember that portion in um, in Matthew 11:29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. He means I have work to do in the world, and I'm the one you need to be yoked to if you're going to do that work. Well, Paul says, don't let yourself be yoked together with an unbeliever. Now, if we wanted to apply this we would see that um, one of the purposes for a church is to learn how to do God's work. And uh, this is why a, a believer that really wants to do God's work cannot worship with uh, or in a church effectively that is not doing God's work. Because that's that's one of the purposes of a church, to form a uh, Christians together to do the work of God. Every means possible of keeping those out who are not true uh, workmen in God's vineyard. There is a second aspect, though, since it involves work, even though a person might be saved, if they're doing the work of God the wrong way, you're not to be yoked with them either. Now, there's some analogies in the Old Testament. And... Uh, uh, we'll take time to, to take a couple of those analogies so that you can see the difference, what he means by be ye not unequally yoked together. Uh, and he's talking about doing God's work on this world. This is the day of salvation when we're taking, when we're to be yoked for work, to do God's work in this world. And he's saying, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Separate yourself from them if you're going to be doing God's work. And he gives us the, the reason I will dwell in them and walk in them. In other words, if God is dwelling and walking in a believer, how can that individual work together with somebody in whom God is not walking? It, it's, a, it's a confusion. Now, you may remember some Old Testament regulations that, uh, uh, that emphasize this. Uh, we'll leave 2 Corinthians now and turn back to the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Old Testament, and look in chapter 22 a moment. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 9, Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with divers seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Now, an ox represents God's true servant. He's a clean animal. An ass is an unclean animal. And uh, this is a, an analogy that's saying that a, uh, that a saved person and an unsaved person uh, shan't be yoked together to do God's work. Uh, they they won't, shouldn't grow together. See, uh, the vineyard is that which pr produces fruit unto God. Well, if you're sowing the vineyard with good seed and bad seed, sweet grapes and sour grapes, well, what's going to happen to the grape juice? Uh, is the sweet going to influence the sour, or is the sour going to influence the sweet? Will the sweet make the will the sweet make the sour sweet, or will the sour make the sweet sour? Which way will it be? Uh, just like if you had a glass of clear, clean water and a glass of dirty water. Do you pour the clean water into the dirty water to make the dirty water clean? Does that clean the dirty water? Well, let's do it the other way around. Do you take the dirty... If you put the dirty water into the clean water, what do you have? It'll all be dirty water, will it not? Well, 
this is the this is the rationale that you don't mix something evil with something good. You see, so many times you say, well, we should let anybody into the church that wants to get into the church because they'll hear the gospel and get saved. Well, that's just to completely misunderstand how God works. Uh, it won't be. There's a lot more unsaved people than there are saved. There's a lot more people who profess to be saved than are really saved. And if you let professing Christians into the church, pretty soon you'll let so many of the enemy into the into the church that the enemy will run the church. Uh, and the the bad will defile the good. It always works that way. And he goes on, verse 11, Thou shalt not wear a garment of divers sorts uh, as of wool, wool and an of linen together. Well, of course, that is because one shrinks more than the other. And uh, uh, it, it'll, it'll tear up. Uh, and they don't, they don't react the same to a cleansing agent. If you were, if you were to have uh, a piece of cloth made of two different materials, and then you washed it, uh, to get it clean, and it didn't uh, shrink the same, the whole thing would be useless. Verse 12, Thou shalt make the fringes upon the four quarters of thy vestures, and so forth. But that's uh, those things are a picture. Now, let's see these two aspects of separation in the life of Abraham, beginning in Genesis chapter 12. Our subject is separation. Genesis, chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. In other words, separate yourself. Now Joshua tells us that God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, out of a, an idolatrous family. And this is why Abraham was supposed to leave everything. You see, the other side of the Euphrates River stands for false worship, and the Canaan side of the river Euphrates stands for true worship. And he lived on the other side, Joshua said. And this is why God stopped him and wouldn't let him into the Promised Land until his father died, because he took his father with him. And uh, so God stopped him halfway at Haran on the Euphrates River. And he was right on the dividing line, see. And God says, you can't go into my country until you're separated from all that you had before. And then when his father died at Haran, then he could go on. He shouldn't have ever taken his father with him. He should have left him in Ur of the Chaldees. Now, but Abraham had to separate himself another way. Look at chapter 13, verse 9. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. This is Abraham speaking to Lot. Separate thyself, I pray, from me. If thou wilt uh, take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if thou wilt uh, depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest out unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from the other. Now you see, Lot was saved. Peter tells us he was. He calls him the justified Lot. Lot was not to be left. It wasn't. Lot was not supposed to be left in, uh, in Ur of the Chaldees. He didn't belong there. But his heart was still there because, remember, he went down to Egypt, was the world. he was enamored by the things of the world. He was what we would call a carnal Christian, Lot was. And uh, he had to be saved out of Sodom and Gomorrah before they were destroyed because he was God's, not Sodom's. And, uh, but he liked the things of the world and he lived among the things of the world. That's why he chose the ways of the world. And God could not use Abraham until Abraham was separated from that type of a Christian. And as long as you consort with Christians that are more enamored by the world than they are by God, God cannot use you. You've got to be separated from them. Now look what happened. 
Verse 11 again, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, uh, the one from the other. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom, and the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him, that's very important. What did the Lord say to Abraham after Lot was separated from him? He said, lift up now thine eyes after you're separated. Lift up now thine eyes and look uh, from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which thou seest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed forever and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt uh, by the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Then he was ready to do God's work because he had separated himself. So if we're going to do God's work, we need to be separated from the world not yoked together with unbelievers. Primarily, that's speaking about if we plan to do God's work. In doing God's work, it has nothing to do with uh, your secular occupation that you might uh, work beside an unsaved. You don't have to try to find a job where everybody's saved. I'm not talking about that. It's in doing the work of the Lord. You're to be separated only unto those who are doing the work of the Lord, whether they're saved or unsaved. And then the work of God really gets started. Now, the other uh, analogy we want to use hurriedly is in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes right after First and Second Chronicles, and then Ezra and then Nehemiah, if you remember. It's two back from Job. And just before you get to Esther, Nehemiah chapter 13, the last chapter in Nehemiah. Nehemiah 13, 1. And on that day they read in the book of Moses, in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Why? Because... They stand for false religion. They, they came from a perverted beginning to start with. They were the two sons. Ammon and Moab were the two sons of Lot by his own daughters. Uh, you can read the story in the 19th chapter of Genesis. Verse 2, Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, and that he should curse them, howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass, when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all of the mixed multitude. That means all these people that were not true Israelites. And before this, Eliashib, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. And he prepared, had prepared for him a great chamber where aforetimes they had laid the meat offering, that is the meal for the meal offering, the frankincense and the vessels and the tithes and the corn and the new wine and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and to the singers and the porters and the offers uh, of the priests, but in all this time uh, was not I in Jerusalem. For in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I a leave of the king, and I came to Jerusalem, and discovered the evil that Elisha had done for Tobiah in preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the God, uh, of our God, in the house of God, and it grieved me sore. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chamber, and thence brought I again the vessels of the house of God and the meal offering and the frankincense. Well, the meal offering stands for the holiness of Christ. The frankincense stands for uh, true worship, uh, the vessels uh, are utilized for God, and the corn, Christ is suchness, the new wine, the joy of the Holy Spirit, the oil, the power of the Holy Spirit, and so forth. All of those things of God. Now, here's what had happened. This Tobiah is a character that runs all through Nehemiah. He was an Ammonite. And in the first 
in the second chapter, you see him ridiculing. When, when Nehemiah was sent to build up the walls of Jericho, he, he ridiculed it. And they all stood there and laughed. He, he, he got the laughing gallery together. And they said a fox could go up and knock down a wall like that. And then when they found out that, uh, that they were completing the walls, then uh, they, they changed their tune. And they said, well, come, we want to talk to you. We want to join together. We want to help you, Tobias said. Nehemiah says, look, I got work to do. Uh, I don't have time to talk to you. And then that made him mad, and so he tried to get the governmental authorities to tear the walls down. He was trying every means. So Tobiah, who was against God's work, he was trying every means he could. Now, when Nehemiah, the spiritual servant of God, had to go back on an errand, then the guy that followed Nehemiah, uh, he fell for Tobiah's wiles. And Tobiah had caused all of God's stuff to be taken out of the, uh, the temple, and he put all his personal belongings right in the middle of the temple. And he was living there, right in the temple, when, when Nehemiah got back. And that's what will happen. If you give place to an Ammonite, so to speak, if you give place to somebody who's really against God, pretty soon he'll take over. And that's what you see there. Tobiah took over. And a lot of Christians have got a Tobiah in their closet instead of frankincense and corn and wine and all of that. Uh, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, it says, for your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of us have got a, a Tobiah living in God's temple when God's temple should be reserved for frankincense and grain and oil and wine. And you need for a Nehemiah to come along and put him out with all of his because he's got no business there. Now, here's what he did while he was there. He had the Israelites intermarry with the Ashdodites and the rest of his ilk, uh, you see, so that, uh, uh, that uh, it would be perverted. Here you have it, verse 23 of, of Nehemiah 13. In those days also I saw, uh, saw I Jews who had married women of Ashdod and Ammon and Moab and their children spoke half the speech of Ashdod and could not speak the Jewish language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons. What it's saying here, if you have a Christian and they marry an unsaved person, that the children will speak like the unsaved person, not like the saved person. They'll speak with the language of the Ashdodite and the Ammonite. It doesn't work the other way around. And so many of our Christian young people uh, marry an unsaved person saying, well, I'll win him to Christ. But God says, no, it doesn't work that way. The result is that the children, the offspring, speak the language of an Ammonite or an Ashdodite instead of the language of a Jew, or the unspiritual instead of the spiritual. So that's, the, that's your analogies of the lack of separation that you have in the Bible. There's many of them, but I just selected two. Now, let me say this. The doctrine of separation is a doctrine throughout the Bible. And I would suggest that you get a good chain reference Bible, for instance, like the Schofield Bible, and you look up in your chain references or in your annotation the word separated and follow that through the Bible, and the Holy Spirit will teach you about do God's doctrine of separation. And it'll go all the way from Genesis, where we were, to Revelation. And in Revelation, he'll, be, he'll still be saying, come ye out from my people because I am a holy God. And that theme will be carried all the way through the Bible. And it's the most, I'd say, neglected theme among those who claim to be doing God's work in the world. And we treated it very poorly. And I do not uh, purport to have taught tonight on the doctrine of separation. I simply pointed out some places where you can learn by the Word of God through the Holy Spirit uh, what this doctrine is all about.
if we're going to teach it, we need to spend at least four one-hour lessons just on the doctrine of separation, if that's what we were doing. But we're going through 2 Corinthians verse by verse. We're not taking topical Bible studies. But you do well to spend many hours on this topic, separated unto God. Shall we pray? Father, we pray that we'd be impressed with the fact that our God is a holy God and his work is a holy work. And neither is it to be in him to, uh, yoked to those who do not appreciate the holiness of God. And may we be admonished by thy word in Jesus' name. Amen.